and tells me to start recording. So, uh, but tonight we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11. I, I love this chapter because, I mean, I think it puts into perspective the whole matter of faith. That faith was essential in the Old Testament just as much as it's essential today. And so faith has always been a, a way of believing when you don't have anything basically tangible to stand on that says, hey, okay, I need proof. What's, what's, the, what's the state that has the motto, show me state? Is oh, that I Missouri? Forget. Huh? Oh, I forget. Is I that Missouri? Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. I think it is. Yeah. And, and since Margaret said it, that's what it is. And yeah. uh, <laughs> it's the show me. That's it. And they're the ones basically, hey, man, you got to prove it to me. Show me and then I'll believe it. Right. Well, with faith, it's not that way. Faith is where we end up saying, OK, God said it. That's good enough for me. I believe it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to carry it out. That's faith, okay, where you just trust God, even in the midst of not having anything tangible to hang on to uh, all the time, you know, so, I mean, faith isn't something, you know, that people just automatically accept. Now, you've probably heard pastors talk about faith, where they'll say, yeah, but you get onto a, a plane, and you trust it, even though you, you know, don't know if it's going to crash or whatnot. Well, to some extent, that's faith. But really, that's not total faith, because you know that planes, for the most part, fly. They get you to where they're going to go. Even though, you know, you get in a taxi, somebody drives you, or in an Uber, somebody drives you, you're trusting that person. But you know, you know, for the most part, that the statistics are good, that, yeah, going through that, you're going to be able to trust the, the vehicle and the driver. So that's not really totally faith, uh, not like the faith that we put in God and that we trust him, because how many of us have had uh, an actual, uh, more than an epiphany? I mean, we're talking about actually God showed up in their house and sat down with you at the table and you guys were able to talk. I mean, how many of you have had that experience with God? Not any of us, right? But yet, at the same time, we trust him just as much as if he had sat down at the table with us and had a meal with us and told us what he wants from us. I mean, so in essence, we trust him just as if he was, you know, we were daily having interaction with him on an actual corporeal level. In other words, in person. So that's what faith Okay, faith goes beyond what our senses tell us. Because, hey, our senses can lie to us. I mean, that's reality. But God tells us what we need to know, and he does it through his word. And that's what we're going to be studying today. Because, I mean, we're going to look in chapter 11 about some of the people that were around before there were any scriptures. And so, in other words, everything that would have been passed down would have been passed down through oral tradition. In other words, people would have ended up saying, okay, I, God, you know, revealed to us or talked to us or said to us these things, and then they would take those things and they would pass them down throughout the generations. So that's called oral tradition. Back then, they didn't have books or scrolls in the sense that we have them today or codexes. Codex was the forerunner to what we call a book today. It came after the scroll, but and it came before the books. So uh, when we look at these kind of things, and we realize that as we follow Christ, we do it because we trust him. That is faith. Okay. Oh, here comes El El Elkie, Donna. So let's see if she is able to join us today. Uh, there she is. There's Elkie. Hi. Welcome. Oh, she's still connecting the audio. So, she went on the rafting trip with us too. Oh, really? You guys have a good time? I mean, all of you had a good time then. Oh, I I know I did. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, there she is. Okay, hi, hi. Elke. Welcome. How are you? I'm here. Doing well. <laughs> yeah, thank God you're able to get in today. Yes, I make it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Praise <What>? the Lord. <laughs> yeah. So as we're talking about faith, you know how today in today's, uh, oh, somebody else is trying to join in on iPhone. I don't know who that is. Uh, I wonder if it's Mark. But one of the things that we find in faith is that in today's vernacular, sometimes what ends up happening is people say, what faith are you? When they ask you that, what is it that they're really asking? Religion. Okay, religion. Denomination. They may be asking, what church do you attend? Or they may be asking, maybe, uh, are you from some, you know, far eastern you know, kind of uh, religious belief. So, I mean, faith doesn't just necessarily have to be Christian. It can be who knows what. You know, it's, it's what do you, you know, if you have a spiritual knack in your life, what is your spiritual focus? And that's kind of a faith thing. So, in other words, anytime, I think, I think uh, Gene said it best, you know, anytime you're talking about religion, you know, I mean, you're, you're, kind of treading on that ground of what it is that faith is and the way that culture today seems to identify faith with. But faith isn't just a label. Faith is truly a trust and a belief in something that your senses don't fully capture. You have to do it from the heart. It's something that requires you to be able to say, okay, the Bible says this. I know that the Bible is God's word. And since I trust God and I believe in God, then I have faith that God will do what he says he'll do. Because we know that the Bible is God's word. We know that God provided God's word for us. And so we trust him to give us insight and understanding as we follow his, his guidance and his word. And we trust him. And part of trusting is to obey. So it's not where you say, okay, I'm good on that, but eh, I'm not so good on this other thing. Because, I mean, faith says either you trust God and you will adhere to what he has or you won't. It's not, you know, a pick and choose kind of thing. So, I mean, that's where faith comes in because a lot of times we can't explain it. Some of the things that we read in the Bible are mysteries and are difficult just to comprehend and accept for face value just by virtue of the fact that that's what God's word says. But yet we do it. When we do it, that's what we're doing through faith. And that's what we're going to see in this chapter as we go through Hebrews 11. So any questions about faith and what it is as we get into it in chapter 11? Okay. Well, then let's... Hey, by the way, Aaron, hello, brother. Hope you're doing well. Uh, hello. How's life treating you, brother? Better, th better than I deserve. <laughs> Amen. Better than any of us deserve, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, notice that angel's with us? Well, we could use all the angels we can get. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Okay, well, let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We praise you that you're here with us. And we know by faith that you love us way beyond anything we deserve. And by faith, we accept your grace and your mercy that you give us on a daily basis. Lord, I pray for our brother Victor. He's dealing with, you know, you know, a physiological issue that needs healing. Lord, just put your healing hand on him so that he can get past, you know, this part of pain that he's having to deal with and that you would heal and bring him back in terms of, you know, feeling good uh, and, and be able to put this, this problem that he has behind him for right now. So, Lord, now be with us, dear Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds and let us hear and hear and understand what you have for us today. And we thank you that you're here with us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. I didn't hear what's wrong with Victor, Ted. Uh, prostate. He's on prostate issues that are causing him some problems. 
Come on. That's, that's an area you don't want a monkey around with. No, it's – and right now he's going through some pain, you know. So, okay, let's see here. Let me share out what we got here. I'm uh, – for those that are new, I'm using the Christian Standard Bible. It's, it's very close to the English Standard Version, but if you want to look at a different one, I can swap out to a New American Standard or a New King James Version or a New Revised Standard or – uh, New International if you want at any time. So if you want to see what it says in any of those others, just stop me. And for those who haven't been in our class before, hey, we're, op we're a very interactive class. If you have something, just, hey, join in. I'll, I'll stop talking, let you talk, and ask your questions or maybe your comments, add your comments. Um, that's how we learn, is that all of us uh, learn together. Okay, Sherry's coming in. Um, Let's see here. Aaron's here. And there's somebody that says iPhone, but I don't know who that Ivan is. Ivan and Julie. What's that? Ivan and Julie, we're here. And oh, we're Ivan and Julie. There we go. Thanks, Ivan and Julie. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. I hope you guys are feeling okay. Yes. Yes, we are. Oh, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that. So. Thank you. Amen. So, we got a good group tonight. So, I'll tell you, this is a great chapter. So let's just join in and see where it goes, okay? Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. In other words, by faith, we want good things, don't we? We want good things as part of our reality. We want those things that are going to make us feel good, make us be at peace, and be able to live a daily life overcoming any of the challenges that come our way. That's reality and that's faith in Christ in the way that he's promised he will give us, you know, the ability to overcome any of those things that are, that, that present themselves as challenges in our life. So that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the positive, those things that are uplifting, building up, and especially the hope it, that we really look at is the hope that we have in Christ at the end. We get to go be with him, whether we pass, uh, whether we die and we get to go be with him or whether he comes back and takes us, we, either way, we get to go be with him. That's hope because then we say we have eternal life with Jesus Christ. Here and now, we already have eternal life. It already started at the point where we accepted Jesus as our Savior and came into relationship with him. And then we have him throughout this portion of our lives until we die or Christ comes back. But then from that point on, we are with Jesus forever. And we will be with him forever and ever. That's hope. Okay, that's saying hey, we've got something to look forward to that is awesome. Even though we've, we don't have the, the valid proof in the sense of having something tangible, that is what God's word says, and so we accept it. Since Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also, we accept that. We say, thank you, Lord Jesus. We, we thank you that you've got a place for us and we will be with you forever and ever. And this is a place, in, in re, like where it says in Revelation, that there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. It will be a place of love and joy. And I don't mean that as a cliche term, but as a true way that we will get along with each other in heaven. And I mean, we as Christians should be getting along that way now, but we don't quite achieve that, do we? We fall short of really being able to love each other at the level we need to and have the joy amongst each other, each other that we should have. We just fall short of that. And that's sad because that's what God wants for us even here and now. But yet we fall short. But we keep our eyes on him because we know that as we become more like Christ, sanctification, if you will, as we become more like him, we will develop more of those character values that model Christ's values uh, that he did while he was here on earth. We need to look like Christ in the way that we interact with each other. And that's why I said by 
by our love, that's how the world will know us, that we are children of God. And by that, we would also uplift each other. We meet each other's needs, love each other, care for each other. So that's the hope. And our proof isn't in the sense of tangible stuff that we say, okay, hey, yeah, I, I have, God gave me this coin, and I have this coin that is my assurance of going to heaven. No, it's not that. The Holy Spirit is our assurance. Do you see the Holy Spirit? No, we don't see him, but yet the Holy Spirit indwells those who have Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so the Holy Spirit is our guarantee, as Paul puts it, our assurance that we get to go be with Christ. So see, it takes faith to accept that because we don't see it with our eyes. We see it with our heart. We know it in our hearts. And so we trust God that what his word says is true. That is faith. So it's, it's, I think it's beautiful, actually. As a matter of fact, if you go back and study all of the Christianity throughout the centuries, you find that that was something that people had trouble dealing with, okay? But I remember that, you know, when you go back and look at Luther, Luther and the, uh, basically some of the words that came out between there and the Reformation was that sola fide, meaning by faith alone. And so when you look at that faith, you realize, wow, faith is important, and it's an ingredient that we need in our walk with the Lord. And it goes back to the old hymn, and I think it's a beautiful hymn. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, trusting and obeying requires you to feel like what you're trusting and obeying is solid, and it's empirical. It's something that has value to trust and to obey. But see, it's something you don't see. You just accept by virtue of the fact that it is God's word and the Holy Spirit gives you that assurance and you trust it and obey it on a daily basis because that brings you closer to, uh, to the Lord on a daily basis as we seek him, as we do what he calls us to do. So that's why in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the writer starts off right off the bat trying to quell anything that the Jews may say about what faith is. Because the Jews, remember, the Jews had always had a temple. God had always resided with them, even though not corporeally in person, they did have the Ark of the Covenant, and God lived in between the cherubim. He actually resided in between the cherubim in the Holy of Holies at the temple all the way until Jesus died on the cross. So the, the Jews always had God with them. In a sense, they didn't really require as much faith because they had something tangible. They knew the high priest could go in every year to the Holy of Holies, and God, they, he interacted with God in the Holy of Holies there. So that's why the writer of Hebrews now is pointing to the fact that now, there is no Ark of the Covenant. God doesn't reside in the temple in that sense. God has changed that. Now he resides in each and every believer now. So that's going to be a real switch for the Jews having to come out of that mindset of where God resides and the fact that God now resides in the person, the individual. And for that to happen, they need faith. But the picture now that the writer of Hebrews paints is he goes back. He says, okay, let's go back and let's take a look at what faith was all about. In other words, they, the Jews understood the Old Testament for the most part. So he's saying, let's go back and see how faith worked even throughout the Old Testament. Let's take a look. Let's see what the scriptures say about faith. So he goes into verse 2. For by this, talking about faith, our ancestors were approved. So he's saying, hey, even our ancestors, that goes all the way to Adam, okay, from Adam all the way up to Jesus. Those are the ancestors they're talking about. They were approved through faith. So they say, well, wait a minute, really? 
And they were proof of faith. I thought they were a proof through the law, which are the Ten Commandments, you know, and those other commandments that were given in Exodus and Leviticus. And he's saying, no, that's not how they were approved. It wasn't those laws and the works. It was the faith of trusting God in the process of upholding the laws or whatever. It actually came down to the belief in God and trusting him that was more important than the laws in and of themselves, just trying to keep laws. And so that's where he's going with this. That's why he's saying, hey, our ancestors were approved by their faith. Because remember, he's going to go back before uh, with some of these people he's going to be talking about. There was no law in place yet. There was no, you know, scriptures in the sense of what they had, you know, that Moses had at Mount Sinai. So he says in verse 3, by faith, accepting what we haven't seen, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that were not seen or not visible, okay? In other words, God created, all of creation was created out of nothing. And so that's a hard thing to understand, especially in today's environment where scientific, you know, requirements of proof really stand out. And think about uh, we're not just talking about the Jews here, although he's talking to a Jewish community. We're talking about an atheistic group of people that are out there that say, no way. You know, there is no way that there is a God that created anything. You know, there was a big bang, and that's what caused everything to happen. Now, of course, they can't prove any of that. So in essence, guess what? Atheists require faith to go down the road of what they technically say they believe. Because, hey, they have nothing, not even science can back up what it is that they believe. So that's reality. So in a way, in a way it, it just makes it funny that, you know, people just want to have something that they believe in so that they don't have to accept God. See, and that's atheism. They would it rather more faith accept to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, I mean, it, when you, actually, it, it just evolution to me is more a belief in insanity than it really is a believing in God. And I mean, I'm not trying to knock people, but it they have less to hang their hat on in in evolution try a type of belief an evolution type of a construct to get people to where they are then then it takes in terms of faith to believe in an all-powerful creator god and so when you look at things like that you realize man you know people will do anything and believe anything just so that they don't have to accept that there is an all-powerful god and a God who is the creator of the universe. And, you know, what's really sad is they'd rather not have a loving, caring God. J they would rather just have a, a way of differentiating the fact that in their minds that, hey, there is no God out there. You know, so they'll hang their hat on something that is even more ludicrous across the board. And, hey, I like science. Don't get me wrong. But I'll tell you what the science that they believe is is a fallacious science it's, there's nothing in it really to be able to support the fact that god created everything and so they'd rather just you know argue with everybody else about the fact that hey what they believe has more merit and value than believing in a god because and then what's their excuse they say those that believe in a God just are weak people that need a crutch to put their arm on, you know, because they can't believe in something more solid. It's like, yeah, and you say evolution is more solid? I don't think so. You know, bring it to bear in terms of proof. And they can't. That's the reality. They can't. So when we see faith by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Yes, it takes faith. It's not something that we can say, okay, hey, 
just because Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, we have tangible proof right now that God is the one that did the create. You know, I mean, if you have somebody that, you know, comes from a neutral standpoint, they don't know anything about God, they don't know anything about, you know, uh, evolution, but you come in, and you just and you take that person and you say, hey, I want to tell you about a wonderful God who loves you very much. As a matter of fact, guess what? He created everything that there is. Everything that you see, you were created by him. The heavens were created by him. All the galaxies, the billions and billions of galaxies out there were created by him. And he did it because he loves you and he wants you to have something wonderful and good in your life. Think about it from a person coming from a neutral standpoint, that's going to that's gonna take a lot to believe that until the Holy Spirit does the work in that person's heart, right? right? Because all of a sudden, you're telling them to believe something that is not tangible. You're telling them to believe something that comes from a requirement to trust that what I'm telling you is true. And they're going to say, why should I trust you that what you're telling me is true? You know, and then, of course, it gets on to apologetics. You could go down, you know, uh, telling where the Bible came from and that it is God's word and it was built up through that. But still, no matter what road you take them down in following Christ, faith is required to be able to accept all of these things that we're talking about. Now, with the Jews, they believe that God was the creator God. So, I mean, at least they would have had that, right? But He's making the point that what they are doing by accepting that God is the one who created everything, they are demonstrating faith in accepting that, that position. So that's what he's building on as he's talking about faith here in verse 3. And so that's why he's saying it, because they understand that way of believing. So now he's saying, see, you accept that, so let's keep going. He says, okay, now you accept that. Let's go all the way back. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. And he says, look, he doesn't talk about Adam and Eve, but he does talk about Abel, okay? The son, the two sons of Adam and Eve, right? That we, had, that we know of, they started it out, right? Look what happened. In verse four, he says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. Well, if you go back and you look at those first few chapters, you know, of Genesis, and you look at the story of Cain and Abel in chapter 3, right, where they're having this issue. Uh, Cain, and it all ha it was all around a sacrifice. And the issue was, was either of their sacrifices right or wrong? No. The sacrifices were fine. It wasn't the sacrifice that was the issue. The problem was a heart issue. And so, and of course, you know, with Cain, Cain wanted to offer up the fruits of the land. He was a guy that God had given him the skill to be able to work the land. Well, some, some would say, well, he didn't give of his first fruits. He just gave of fruits that he had. Well, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. All I know is that before God, Cain's sacrifice of a lamb was more acceptable to God than what Cain's sacrifice of his fruits were to him. Now, I, it, what it all comes down to is when we accept God by faith, our hearts are right before him. Remember, God sees the heart, right? He's not looking at the thing that we're, we tend to look at. He's looking at why are you doing it and is your heart right before me? See, with, with Cain, who killed Abel, his heart wasn't right. I think his faith was not established. He was, he was just doing things more out of ritual. And you would say, wait a minute, they had ritual back then? I think so. I think Adam would have taught his sons based on what they understood. And so by understanding that, they would have acted based on what they knew, right? And so guess what? The only thing that Cain and Abel would have known is what his mom and dad would have taught him, Adam and Eve. God had revealed things to them, believe me. I mean, they weren't 
ignorant. You know, a lot of times we tend to say, yeah, but, you know, this was the age of innocence. You know, they didn't really know anything. I, I think God had revealed enough to them to where they understood enough of what was going on to make a decision. Because remember, once they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they could weigh things now. They could weigh what is good and what isn't good. Well, in this case, what we're seeing is that by faith, we see that Abel weighed out the good, right? Cain did not. Cain did not weigh out the good. Because if you go back and read, he says, you know, God gave him a warning too. He said, hey, you know, evil is knocking at your door. You know, in other words, don't go down this road. You don't have to act this way. You can change. Your heart is wrong. Get your heart right. Trust me, God had even told him. God had even spoken to him. But yet Cain still went down the wrong road, right? So Cain's, you know, what we look at is that Cain did not have, you know, uh, that, that heart for God. Okay. Um, Donna says, I always thought that Abel's sacrifice was blood equals sin. Well, uh, I mean, when you look at that, uh, Cain's was fellowship. No, it worked both ways. When you look at the sacrifice, remember, there was no sacrificial system yet then, okay? Although I know what Donna's saying, that she's thinking that the blood of the lamb that Cain offered, or Abel offered, was, since it was a blood offering, it fit within what God had showed offerings to be later on. Remember uh, where he established all of the specific offerings and sacrifices all the way back, or all the way over in Moses's time? Well, in this case, there was no law. There was no established uh, realm of what a sacrifice should be. In other words, God was looking at the heart at this time. Now, I think, I think that if Abel's or Cain's heart had been right before God, I think he would have accepted his sacrifice. But it, it should have been such that what he wanted was to show God that his heart was right before him. And that's why he was offering, you know, th that sacrifice. Because, I mean, there are sacrifices of first fruits and other sacrifices that actually would come in as well, even in Moses' time frame. But again, it all comes down to, do you, is your heart right before the Lord? And I think that's what we have to understand that, that Cain was following short with. He just didn't, his heart wasn't right before God. And so I don't think God was telling him, hey, if you offer a lamb like Abel's doing, that then your heart is right. No. Because I think it, even if, if they both had offered the same thing, I think the same result would have happened. I think Cain's heart would have still been wrong before God. Um, but in that time, we see that God gave like different skill sets to people. Because we see that, hey, even back then, they had metallurgical workers. They had those who knew how to make and play instruments. And we're talking first generation people here. You know, I mean, well, second generation people that were already doing. It. You're saying, how could they have learned that? I think God had built that into people. So I think Cain had a skill to work the land, whereas Abel had a skill to work with the flocks and whatnot. So I think that when it comes right down to it, it's your heart that is important. Okay. Okay, so Donna says, I always thought that Abel's sacrifice was blood, which equals sin. Cain's fellowship, fruit of the land, was a fellowship offering. Can't have fellowship till you've repented of your sin. And, and that comes down to it. I mean, I, I think that's a valid point, Donna, but it still is a heart thing, isn't it? It still has to be, like you say, if you're not repenting, it doesn't matter what good of a sacrifice it is that you're bringing into the Lord. And I know you're saying, hey, to repent of sin, maybe you need a blood sacrifice. That would have been pointing forward to like Jesus dying on the cross, you know, where he shed his blood. So no, you make a good point. But still, no matter what, it's Cain's heart that is wrong before God. And guess what? As soon as God told him, hey, you need to check out this 
problem you've got in your heart, this, this issue of evil knocking at the door of your heart, what happened? Did he address it? Did he say, oh, did he get down on his knees? Did he try to repent like Donna said? No, he didn't. Instead, he was jealous. He sought out his brother and he killed him. So, I mean, obviously Cain's heart was wrong. And of course, there are consequences in sin. Cain ended up receiving consequences for his sin from God, didn't he? So the problem is, is I think Cain wanted more of what he wanted for himself than what God wanted for him. Whereas Abel wanted to please God based on what God wanted for him. And that was where, what we're seeing here is the result of eating the fruit of good and evil. We're seeing Abel, Abel's heart was righteous before God, Cain's was not. So good and evil is playing out and we're seeing it in the first generation already, we're seeing the problem of good and evil in the world. And so, so that's what he's talking about here and why he brings up Cain and Abel's sacrifice. Look what he says. Uh, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did, and it's through faith. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man. He's talking about Abel because God approved his gifts, and even though he is dead, he still speaks through his face, faith. So God approved his gifts. So the question is, it's kind of like Donison. Does that mean that only a blood sacrifice was the right kind of gift? Um, I guess you, you could go down that road. Uh, but the thing is, what, what should Cain have done? Should he have gone to his brother and say, hey, give me a lamb so that I can offer a sacrifice? I don't know. I just feel that the bottom line was his heart was wrong. I don't care if he had had an, a, a, a blood sacrifice. I don't think Cain's heart was right before God. He was already considering the evil that he was going to do, even though God warned him so. So, but we see that even though Abel died, he speaks through his faith because, hey, he did what was right before God. In other words, he trusted and obeyed God. Cain did not. And so that's where you run into this, this issue of good and evil that they were dealing with back then. So, uh, should have traded Abel fruit for lamb, pride. Oh, that's, that's, pride could have been a possibility in there. Yeah, Donna's saying, Maybe he should have traded Abel fruit for a lamb. Again, it would have had, and that would have been a pride thing, but it still would have been that his heart needed to be right for him to even accomplish that, to even be thinking that way. He didn't have the right heart, okay? And so that was the problem with Cain, but Abel did what was right before God. So of that, we see that that is a matter that happened through faith, and guess what? Did, a did Abel go to be with the Lord? Yes, he did. He was righteous before the Lord. Whereas Cain, look at all the issues he had to go through. He ended up getting marked. And he thought everybody was going to want to kill him because he was marked. And you say, well, who are these everyone if only Cain and Abel were the only ones around? You know, <laughs> but apparently, hey, God had let them multiply enough to where he felt that somehow this marking was going to be problematic. But God said, hey, don't worry. I'll take care of you, even though this is going on. So, so that's what we see. We see the whole problem of good and evil rooting out already starting. And the good and the faith that Abel had already established that that was a pattern that pleased God. Faith was essential to pleasing God. Okay, so that's why he brings that out in verse four. Then look who he talks about in verse five. By faith, Enoch was taken away. And so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Oh man, don't you wish we had a resume like that? That we could just say, man, Ah, I wish God, when he looks at me, he could say, I pleased him today just as much as Enoch did. You know, I mean, that's walking with God when you, you know, you please him. And so, 
look, but I think verse six is the most, uh, the beginning of verse six is one of the main factors that we find makes faith so essential in walking with the Lord. It says, now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That makes it clear, right? Because, I mean, faith is essential because if we don't believe, then how can we love him? Right? And, I mean, isn't that what Jesus, uh, you know, responded as one of the most important commandments? We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love our neighbor as ourselves. How can we... How can we do that if we don't believe him in the first place? Or we don't trust that God's word is true and that he gave his word to us. See the problem where we run into with faith, the fact that we put our trust in him and obey him is essential to our walk with him. And that's why faith is so important. And the writer of Hebrews is speaking to it in that respect because if they don't have that belief and that trust in him, in other words, the faith, then it's going to be impossible to please God. Because, I mean, we're not going to obey him if we don't trust him or if we don't accept what he said we have to do. So he says, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So that's what we do. We, through faith, we follow him we draw near to him, our relationship is strengthened with him day by day if we have faith in him, right? So, I mean, this is important. Okay, let me see here. I think, uh, uh, let me see. That's going to be um, Ivan and, and Julie. If you, if you have not faith, you have, you've lost everything. That's the way I think. That's right. Without faith, uh, without faith, we run into a difficult solu difficult problem, a quandary, don't we? Yeah. Oh, never mind. Okay. See, I mean, if we don't if we don't have faith, then we have no way of trusting God, because I mean, do you uh, 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 you know uh, unless you're expecting God to show up. And basically, you know, in person, take you by the hand like Jesus did the 12 disciples. I mean, that's just not going to happen today. So the question is, do you trust what God has given us today, that it truly is God's word, and that it is his guidance to us today to have a deeper relationship with him on a daily basis? That those things that he tells us to do in his word are essential to be able to bring him honor and glory. If you believe those truths, then yes, you will grow. You will deal with him. You will, you will, you know, have a healthy relationship with him and a pleasing relationship with him. So, but yeah, Sherry says, and faith without works is dead, as James tells us, right? Because, I mean, what it comes down to is that this is going a little bit further, but yeah, in terms of Sherry's comment, is that when you trust God to the point where your faith is truly in him, your works will, will show that you truly have faith in God, okay? And that's going off into James, as, you know, I think it's in James chapter 3, uh, talks about faith without works is dead. So now it's not works that says, hey, I need to work to somehow get closer to God, it's the works that he gives us to do that he talks about in Ephesians 2.10 that says God prepared good works for us to do from before two. time. What's that, Margaret? Did you ask something, Margaret? Okay. So as we walk closer to him and we trust him and we obey him, that proves that we are his children, okay? And that proves that we have faith in That's him. That's the issue here. So as we walk with the Lord, we draw closer to him, we trust him more, and that then brings us into closer relationship with him. Oh, Sherry says, she said, 
faith without works is dead. She said, James chapter two. My apologies, I jumped the chapter on you there, Sherry. Yes, James chapter two sounds good. So, I mean, these are real things. Yeah, it's James chapter three. That's the tongue problem, isn't it? So, I mean, when we look at these kind of things and we walk in him by faith, hey, we have all kinds of blessings that the Bible tells us we as believers in Jesus Christ with a relationship with him have in him today. Well, those are beautiful experiences that probably Enoch was experiencing back then in his walk with the Lord. Okay, but we have them available to us today. And a lot of times we say, well, then why isn't Jesus just taking people out of the earth right now, you know, like with Enoch, you know? Well, because he's established a precedent as to what's to happen. He became that precedent. He died and rose again, went to go be with the Father, right? He says that he's going to prepare a place. And the Bible says it's appointed on the man wants to die and then the judgment. So we go through a process now that follows Jesus's routine. And when we die, we get to go be with him. Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Uh, yeah, Donna says, I'm ready to go just like Enoch. <laughs> Amen. Or, or like Elijah, right? In that fiery chariot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, this world definitely makes you say, I'm ready to go now. But God has a purpose for us here. And so that's why we are here. Otherwise, you know, if all, as soon as we were saved, Jesus says, okay, you're done. Come be with me. Who would be around to proclaim the good news to others, right? So he, we have a job. We join God in his work. And we are the ones that are his hands and feet here on earth. Not just to love each other as a family of Christ, but also then as a family of Christ to reach out to others to demonstrate God's love that he has and his desire for bringing in those that are out there to into his realm, you know? So we need to be active in terms of what he's called us to do. And so, I mean, I think it, Enoch's word is beautiful, but I think the best testimony uh, that I hear in the whole Bible is this right here, where it says in verse uh, five, for before he was taken, he was approved as one who pleased God. I mean, man, that is a great testimony. And I mean, man, if we could, if we could just have that testimony in our lives that we please God, Jesus did that, didn't he? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Man, imagine if we could just have that kind of, you know, interaction with God to where we daily please him that way and don't grieve the spirit don't quench the spirit, but we walk in a way that honors and glorifies God in everything we do. Ah, man, that would be awesome, you know? So we keep our eyes on the Lord, and we know that Jesus paid the price, but man, we want to please God, don't we? I think we all deep down want to please God in everything we do, because I mean, that's who we are. We were adopted by him. We want to show that we are his children. So, uh, yeah, good point there, Donna. She says, and who would want to get saved if they knew uh, they would die right away, right? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, these things that we deal with here in this, the here and now. Okay, so that's Enoch now. And we see that faith was required by him, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then look where we jump to. We jump from Enoch to Noah. That's, that's, we're looking at Noah, we're looking in Genesis chapter 9, okay, well, chapter 6 through 9, okay, this is the time of the flood, and uh, God told Noah what to do all the way up till the end of the flood, okay, we're looking at Gen Genesis 6 through 9, so we look at Noah now, and he says, by, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was yet seen, and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. And by faith, now, hey, do you think if God told you to do something that was going to take you 150 years, that you would just go out there, yeah, Lord, I'm, I'm on there, I'm on it, let me go build this ark, you know? Now, it doesn't, don't you think that would take faith? Hey, they didn't have an ocean nearby, right? 
they didn't have anything to put that ark in. He's just building this thing up on land. Isn't that like what they did up in Kentucky? Isn't that ark on land or is it on a, a river or something? I don't know. It's but, on land. They build it on land. Okay. So then basically the same thing as what Noah did, right? Yeah, but, they put a little pond in front of it. So when you look at it from the front, it'll look kind of, well, it's. Oh, I got gotcha. you. In front of it. Oh, there you go. See? But look at this. I mean, this is something. This would have required a lot of faith to do this because how much did it say that Noah got ridiculed for building this thing? He got ridiculed a lot, right? So, <laughs> what's that, Donna? I think, could, I, I think it was big time. I'm sure those people were so evil, they all went, let's go get drunk and go laugh at Noah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, did, didn't anybody see the movie with Russell Crowe? Didn't no, I didn't really, see that. They were really evil people. Yeah, well, doesn't okay. surprise me. You know, the Bible says they were all doing what was right in their own eyes. If so, they did evil continually, yeah. it said. Yeah, sad, isn't it? So, I mean, these are real things that were going on. And as a matter of fact, guess what? It even says that Noah was preaching to them. You know, all this time that he's building the ark, he's also preaching to them. And yet, you know, we see that I'm, now to me, that is a true testament of faith. Because I mean, not only, you know, he didn't listen to the people, he listened to God. He didn't look, he didn't try to pull out the science manuals and try to figure out, hey, wait a minute, there's been ever been rain here. You know, wait a minute, where's this rain going to come from? Let me go out and pull out my meteorology app and put it on my iPhone and see what I can figure out here. No. He did what God told him to do, even though it did not make sense to him. And I mean, hey, sometimes the secrets of God are designed for God, you know, and so he just, we just have to say, yes, Lord, here am I, right? Send me, here am I, use me, do what brings you honor and glory. So I, I have mean, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, people that do brujeria to Christian people, who, like a brujeria is a witchcraft. Right. So that could touch us as a Christian? Uh, no, I, I say that, let me just put it this way. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, witchcraft has no power over you. Okay? Uh, they can try to curse you, but see, the problem with man is, is that they say, uh-oh, I've been cursed. And all of a sudden, when they think they've been cursed, they let their minds wander. No, just trust God. No, Satan has no power of those that are in Christ Jesus. Okay? And so we, yeah. The person asking the ex-wife of my, my son, the whole family do brujeria, do witchcraft. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's out there today. I mean, witchcraft is out there. Because, I mean, Satan's out there, right? He's the prince of the power of the air. But yet, yeah, it has no power over God's children, okay? And you don't let it have power over you either because, you know, you rebuke it in Jesus' name. That's, that's how we as Christians do. Go ahead, uh, Julie. No, I just say amen. Amen. And, I mean, so we have a lot of power in God. But, see, that requires faith, too. Because sometimes, you know, even Christians can say, uh-oh, I've been cursed. Now what do I do? Well, just, hey, just keep your eyes on the Lord. That's what you do. You know, hey. because, yeah, go ahead, Mark. On my life. <laughs> Amen, brother. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't, I can't make it. Uh, no, it's uh, fine, brother. A uh, conversation with someone. But anyway, going back to uh, witchcraft. Yep, there are people that practice witchcraft just the same way people practice uh another religion you got voodoo you got satanism and they they, they they have a temple and they go worship the devil uh Amen. we as a christian i we could still be i'll say oppressed but not possess amen you could feel oppression by the enemy yep. but like you said we have the power to overcome amen in, in jesus amen i mean and and uh sherry says except we get the most spiritual tax it can happen, yes. I mean, a lot of times, you know, hey, Satan's out there. And it's just like, you know, Martin's saying, we can be oppressed by Satan, but we can't be overcome by Satan if the Holy Spirit dwells in you. 
because hey, you can't have Satan and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You have greater is He that is in me than He who is in the world. Amen. Amen. So I mean, once we have once we have turned our lives over to God, and through Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Yes, we will go through times of testing, and we will go through times of oppression, that kind of thing. But the question is, where do you keep your eyes? Do you keep your eyes on the Lord, or do you keep your eyes on the problem? Remember that when Peter, when he got out of the boat, and Jesus told him, walk on the water, come to me. Remember, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on water. It wasn't until he took his eyes off Jesus, started looking at the waves, that he started sinking, right? So we have the power of God to overcome in all situations. The question is, do you keep your eyes on him? Okay. So just remember that. Hey, when Satan comes and starts trying to uh, cause problems and oppress, say, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, you know, my Lord and Savior died for me. He paid the price. I don't have to put up with this. Get behind me, Satan. I don't want nothing to do with you. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's trusting the Lord all the time. Amen. So look at that. We were talking about Noah, right? Uh, he built an ark to deliver his family because God's what God told him to do. Well, God told him to build the ark. It was big enough to be able to accommodate others too, if they had wanted to come, but obviously their hearts were wrong. But look what he says. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Okay. So he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness comes by faith. He condemned the world because he was preaching the gospel. He was preaching the, the message of salvation to them to come into the ark. But the people said, so in essence, that was their condemnation because they didn't believe. They didn't have faith. See the issue? The people basically said, I don't have, I want nothing to do with that crazy man Noah, for heaven's sakes. Until the rain started coming down. And then all of a sudden, what? Then, but God had already closed the door. And what happened? Gone, right? They, they, they was too late then. So, I mean, they had an opportunity, 120 years basically, but they didn't take opportunity to do it. So the only ones that were saved were those that got allowed, which were Moses, his sons, and their wives. And that was it. Eight people all told. Now, were those people totally righteous people? God counted righteousness to Noah. Yeah, they were not righteous. Totally righteous. That's right. They were still sinners too, right? <laughs> Noah wasn't, yeah. wasn't perfect. He was perfect in his gene pool. That was the only thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, I mean, sin had already been there, right? I mean, the curse was already on humanity. Even though Noah was righteous, he was not perfect. You know, so, I mean, these were the issues that we now deal with today. Because, hey, we've inherited it just like Noah had inherited it in his progeny as well. So here we are today because that's why we still look to the Lord by faith. And we still keep him in our focus, right? Okay, so any questions about Noah and his family? Took faith to, to build a cartoon. I have to tell you a cartoon I yeah, saw. There's two worms in the foreground. In the back, in the background, you see Noah fishing with a worm. <laughs> so the female worm says to the male worm, "Now I know why he brought three of us." <laughs> but I, but I thought worms were. What what is it when they they don't need fertilization? Bisexual. What's that? Oh, like antisexual. Yeah, asexual. Uh, don't they uh, reproduce asexually? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that ruins the whole cartoon. Yeah, it does re ruin the cartoon, but I, I know. I <laughs> he brought that's... three worms because he was going to fish with one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So. Ted? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I just want to say that going back to this verse, I mean, yeah, this yeah. chapter here that we're going to uh, be starting today, you know, the, the testimony of this man that conquered so much through faith. Uh, you know, as written for to encourage us the, how much we could we could obtain if we just trust God. But we also, I'll say, we also need people today. And uh, there's there's way for us to is either read biography about you know people who conquer great things through faith. 
because it, you know, that's, that's a testimony. And, and when God does things to, to someone else, it, it's good for that person to share because it, it increases our faith. And that's the reason why this chapter, you know, is list all these heroes of the faith to encourage us. Amen. Yeah. And, and as I said earlier, you, know, it, you got to remember, they had to somehow transfer their understanding of faith because he's talking to Jews from the Old Testament into the New Covenant. See, and what he's doing is painting a picture of belief that happened all the way through the scriptures and that it was just a matter of a continuance into Christ Jesus. See, they hadn't gotten to that point. That's why he's building up, showing that this trust was essential throughout all of history to get to Christ Jesus and to basically to transfer the Jews from the old covenant into the new covenant. And that faith, they were having faith back then. They may not have realized it, but faith was essential in following God then as much as it is essential in following Christ today. And, and that it's the faith that pleases God. It's the faith that says, I trust you, God. I want what you want, God. I want to be used by you, God. And I know that you want what's best. And so that's why I want to be your hands, your feet. The, you know, whether it was Noah, showing that he could do it through building the ark or through us today that says, I'm ready to go do what you want me to do, Lord. And I trust that what you want is best. So yeah, exactly, Martin. It's that, it's that concurrent thing of building up to show that, man, hey, sola fide, it's through faith alone that we walk in Christ's righteousness and that we look to him, right? So yeah, that's what he's building on. Now, remember, in Noah's time, were there any scriptures yet? Nope. Nope, not yet, right? No. So these are all works from God, God representing, and they would have had oral tradition. They're passing down whatever God said through the different generations, okay, orally. So that's how they, you know, they were bringing up their offspring, their children and whatnot, is by passing it along through storytelling or through repetition or something like that. So look, then he picks up at Abraham. Now, Abraham is several generations down from Noah. Okay, remember when Noah showed up, he was living 900 years and Abraham only 150. So we see that each generation from the time of Noah started living less time until, you know, we see in Abraham, Job was expected to have lived around 200 years. So he would have been before Abraham, because remember, he had two families. He already had a grown family and everything that he had going before Satan hit him, that God allowed Satan to, you know, give him the disease and all that and kill all his family. Well, when you look at that, and you figure it out, he would have lived 200, a little over 200 years to basically redo two lives is basically what he ended up doing. Question so, I have to, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. What will, what will be, in your opinion, what will be the uh, decrease uh, of, of the age? Uh, I think when the heavens broke free and the flood, I think God had a perfect environment for life to exist. And I think that when God broke the waters above the heavens uh, that had been, you know, providing a shield, I think that, you know, I mean, if you want to talk scientifically, just I think that that's when UV light started coming through. And I think it started affecting the actual length of life. It actually started destroying the external body more rapidly uh, through that. The body just never adjusted to it but it cut down the length of life that's just my take right and, and i will add to that I, I you know i would say that you know uh, due to the the curse that has been on this on this earth uh, things that just got it's, it's got worse and it's gone down 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 until yep. until we got today oh yeah i mean that's just how god wanted it i mean really that's what it all comes down to because i mean otherwise what what good would it be if we all lived a thousand years each would we do, would we be any better? Would we do any more for the Lord today? Yeah. Nope. Nope. So, I mean, I think, I think that where we are today is what God intended, you know, and so that's where we are. And, you know, but yet what is it that science is trying to do? 
make people live longer, right? <laughs> they want same old lie that goes back to Genesis uh, three: "You shall surely not die." Yeah, that's what they. It's <laughs> like, man, can we keep people alive longer? Maybe even yeah, to the point where they don't die. Right? And they don't want to live. Yeah, because people fear death. I mean, they may not mm -hmm. admit it, but they fear it. Otherwise, why mm -hmm. would they be, you know, searching for a way to try to get to live as long as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they got all this stuff where they're trying to put people's, all these people, the brains into um, uh, transhumanism and all that stuff and doing everything they can to try to make themselves live on forever. Oh, yeah. It's the same old lie. You it shall is. surely not die. <laughs> Trying to bypass the curse. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Work for them very well. Yep. But so, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. 2,000 years. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 2,000 years later, Jesus' time, I think the average lifespan was a lot shorter than it is now. Yeah, they were dealing, I mean, because, I mean, diseases would kick in and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, they may have only been living, the good people, I mean, the ones that were healthiest might have lived to 60, 70, you know, maybe some 80, but I think most of them were 40, 50, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, George. Yeah, I was wondering, um, the age that uh, humans live, could that have been God's way of regulating so there's enough resources for the amount of people? To, I mean, if people live, just imagine if people live to be a thousand years old today, we'd it'd be just a population explosion. <laughs> I just wondered if after the flood that, you know, since all the trees were wiped out, all the animals, if decreasing the life was a way of, so everybody would have a, a chance to survive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's not in the Bible. It's just, you know, something I, you know. Yeah, who's to know? But it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, because God is still in control. So, I, yeah. I, I would say it's possible. What did Elke yeah. say? It's because they don't know Christ. As a believer, we put our trust in him. We are not as scared to die. Yeah, no, I mean, because we don't have fear in death, right? In Christ Jesus, we don't have to fear death. Because we know what our hope is that I spoke about earlier, right? Our hope is in him to live with him forever and ever. So we don't have to fear that. And, and I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a Christian that would want to stick around longer. Even Paul said, I'd rather, you know, die and go be with Christ than stick around if I was given the option, right? Absent from the body is to be <laughs> present with Christ. And, and, I'm ready why, to go. <laughs> exactly. And why would anybody want to hang out here, you know, Man. dealing with all the issues and the problems, unless God specifically had a, a role for you to do. And you're like, yes, I got to still do that role for the Lord, you know? I mean, other than that, why else would you want to hang out here? Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the same time, uh, we got to look at the other side of the story. That doesn't mean that we as a Christian, we're going to neglect ourselves and not try to be healthy because I don't want to be sick for every uh, time I have here. You know what? I want, to I want to die if it's possible. I want to die healthy. Amen. Because I do not want to be in the doctor's hands. I, want, I just... As you know, you just another number. Right. So we got, we have to take care of ourselves. Amen. We know we're not going to stay here forever, but sometimes we bring uh, sickness to our life because we, we are, I guess, not being diligent. There you go. I mean, because, yeah, we are God's vessels. So we should take care of these vessels to the point where, I mean, it's <laughs> his time to take us home, not that we force uh, ourselves to go home. You know, because some would say, well, if I accept the Lord Jesus Christ, then why don't I just off myself? You know, that way I can get to go be with him. Well, is that how you want to end up coming into his kingdom? You know, by say, basically saying, God, uh, I just wanted to come home now. You know, forget this. I didn't want to do what you wanted me to do. I just wanted to come home now. You know, is that the way you want to come into his kingdom? No, I don't think so. I, I, I really like how Isaiah ended up when God, you know, commissioned him to go do his work in Isaiah chapter six, you know, I mean, at the end of it, you know, of, of God talking to him, he said, here am I, God, send me, you know, in other words, that's where we need to be, is we need to say, Lord, I've given my life over to you, use it in the way you want to use it, as long as you want to use it, and then at your time, you take me home, you know, but like Martin says, we don't do that, you know, stupidly 
we do it, you know, conscientiously that we take care of the body that God gave us because, hey, it's his temple, right? We should take care of it in a way that pleases God. And then he'll take us home in his time. And I think that's the best way to come into his presence is that we can say, thank you, Lord. I did what you called me to do. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Doris, it's wrong um, to feel uh, bad about dying, like a scare of dying. Like I have seen myself a lot of different times on the other side than here, but it's being afraid. I have seen Ivan in the other side as well, more than in this side. Mm -hmm. And the the more we I had seen that myself over there, I get more scared because the way that I had uh, um, how do you say experience experience that the in the in health wise I uh, you know I trust God I have faith in God we've been going through a lot but when we have been in that side of close to death I have feel scared so that's normal right uh it's see i think i don't think you're scared about what's going to happen when you die i think we're scared of death because that was never this god never intended for death to be part of who we are god intended us to be alive with him forever so death is foreign okay to these bodies and so death is not a, something that God intended us to have to endure. But because of our sin, death will come. I mean, these bodies will die unless Jesus comes back first. So th what you fear, I think, isn't so much what's to come at death. What you fear is that transition because most of us end up saying, man, I don't want to go through pain or I don't want to have to go through the 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 difficulties of what death entails and whatnot but so uh, it's it's not going to ever death is never going to be palatable to us it's not like we're going to say yay i want to die let's die now okay goody you know it's if it's you just not, down and go to sleep and not wake up that would be okay but most that, of the time that's not how you die see exactly but it, you, a painful, you know, either with cancer, with slow, painful death, or a right. really a whole lot of pain in your chest of a heart attack or something really painful. And that's what we are afraid of is the pain, I think. Not and, the actual crossing over once we're there. We're yeah. not going to feel it anymore. Amen. Because, I mean, think about it. I mean, when we die, look at what we have to go through in death, right? It's, I think there, although we as Christians who are in Christ Jesus know what will happen, we will get to go be with the Lord. So, and we will be with him forever and ever is what the Bible says. We have a hope and a purpose. And I think as we get closer to the Lord, I think that death is, isn't so pronounced as a problematic transition in our lives. Um, so I, I just tell you, hey, keep your eyes on the Lord uh, and uh, look look for that because I'll tell you, uh, otherwise, you know, we end up, it's it's easy to end up getting into a, a tizzy about dying. Um, I, I, remember, at the end of time, what does God throw into hell besides Satan? Okay. <laughs> Death. Yeah. Of death. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he throws death into hell. So in other words, death is a thing that has come into being when we sinned against God. Because remember, isn't that what God told Adam? Hey, of the tree in the middle of the garden you shall not eat, because on the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Right? Through, through so, sin came death. That's right. So death became a thing. And that's what we hate is that curse because that was the curse. We fear what the curse results in. And that's death. Death of this body. But it's not this body that's important. You know, it's, it's being with him that's important. So it's, it's that issue of death that God never had really wanted to put into practice until we, in and of ourselves, 
ended up, you know, being problematic in that area because yeah. of the fact that we didn't obey God, right? Learning. Yeah. Learning. Yeah, go ahead, He's Martin. Talking first. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Martin first and, and then Sherry. Go ahead, Martin. And, and we have to remember that as a Christian, we we basically we, we don't die. We, you know, we, we, we fall asleep in a sense, but death cannot touch us anymore. Amen. Because once we die, we're in the presence of God. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's it's a hard concept to understand because it's not like we do it every day. It's a one-time event in terms of this us separating from this body and being with the Lord. And so I think a lot of times people don't fully understand what all that entails and they fear what they don't understand in the process of it. Okay. So, but we as believers, I'll tell you what, man, don't lose focus on the fact that we are God's children. God wants the best for us. And as Martin says, Hey, when we accepted Jesus Christ, we already became his children. We already became eternal beings in him. It's just a transition out of this life into being with him. In other words, we just switch dimensions, if you will. We're not in this world anymore. We're in it with him. And so it's, it's that separation of the body and being with him that is the issue that people, you know, fear the most is, well, what does that mean? How does it happen? But we can be assured. See, that's the faith thing about it. The faith thing about it is that we know that when that happens, we will be with him. And that's what matters. And so because of that, we don't have to fear death in and of itself. Yes, we may not want all the pain or any of the issues that come with death, but the reality of it is, hey, when it does happen, at the instant it happens, we will be with him. And death no longer has a hold on us at that point, because then we will be, death no longer has a hold on this in the sense of this body, because once we leave this body, we're with him forever and ever. Amen. I mean, he's technically with us now, you know, but we'll the issue is, indeed. yeah, what's that, Martin? I say, well, we'll be, we will be free indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Free. Yep. Yeah, Sherry, what did you have? Okay. okay I'm going backwards because okay. I couldn't get a a comment in when you were on that subject, but remember when <laughs> when you said um, about you know just offing yourself and just going home now. Um, I had always thought, and maybe it's the wrong thought, but I always thought that like suicide was like an unforgivable sin just because um, we don't have the right to um, you know cause our death. That's God's um, God's no, job to do that. Yeah, so. I always thought it just was unforgivable because um, you have no right to take your own life. So does, I don't know what you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Does God forgive murderers, Sherry, if they come to him and ask for forgiveness? Yeah. But if you're dead, how are you going to ask for forgiveness? Well, you no, gonna, you, like, what you have to ask understand. Ask for forgiveness before you kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good point. No, uh, what ends up happening there is, I mean, think, of, think about, the person that has mental disease. And they, they just, through their mental disease, they see no option, but yet they are in Christ. And somehow they just don't see through their mental condition a way to be able to fix, fix whatever the issue is they're struggling with other than to off themselves. And so they kill themselves. Now, remember, Jesus died for all sin, for those that are in him, for past, present, and future. That means he died for all your sin. Even if you off yourself, he already died for that sin. Now, that's not a license for Christians to go out and kill themselves. That's not it, because God has put us here on this earth for a reason, and our life is to depend on him and on his timing. No, it's not unforgivable, but it's not the way you want to end up in his presence saying, well, God, I just couldn't wait for your time. So I wanted it my way. And so I did it in my time. You know, I mean, we wait for his time because his timing is right. And of course, there will be people that, like I say, have 
mental issues, bad depression issues that they just can't seem to work through. And in that, they may take their lives. Hey, we see, it, as a matter of fact, did you know that suicides in the church are just as high as outside the church today? They're there because people are dealing with stress and with depression and, and uh, these different issues that they just don't see a way out. And, and it, apparently their trust in the Lord isn't sufficient to keep them grounded. And so they just decide to take their lives instead. There's only one unforgivable sin, Sherry, and that is rejection of the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only unforgivable sin. So yes, a, t a person can, a person will be forgiven for committing suicide, but it's not God's plan for people to do. It's not God's plan for people to sin, period. But yet we do, right? We still have this weakness of the flesh. We still have problems we struggle with in the flesh. But yeah, it's not, it's not the preferable way to go and meet the Lord. Did that answer your question, Sherry? Yeah, but they make uh, medications, doctors, and everything for yeah. that issue. So yeah, but <laughs> you can get help. <laughs> it'd be nice, but nothing's perfect. You know, that's the reality, no matter how much, you, I mean, even my brother right now is in the hospital in the mental ward trying to be treated to get restabilized. You know, he's a paranoid schizophrenic and, uh, and, you know, but he's still talking pretty crazy wise. So, you know, and even in his, uh, even in his stabilized state, he still has issues. He still, and it wouldn't surprise me that at some point, he may feel that God told me to kill myself because he, hear, he, he always sees God in these voices. And a lot of times he doesn't interpret it right, you know, and interpret it biblically. And he thinks that the voices override what he already knows about the Bible in many cases. I mean, okay. What about the people that commit suicide that don't have mental illness? I mean, there's still people out there, unless you think that everybody that does that has some sort of mental illness. I, if, I personally if, don't think anybody would kill themselves unless they were really disturbed mentally. N nobody that's like really um, all happy and has a wonderful life and um, has everything, all their cylinders firing at the same time is going to want to take themselves out. The only time you're going to want to take yourself out is when you're really mentally disturbed. Yeah. That's just my point. Well, because um, what if uh, what if your whole family gets murdered and you're the only one left? People will kill themselves out of grief and well, things like disturbed. that. I don't think that's a mental illness. Though. Yeah. Oh, that it's is. It's, it's definitely mentally, you know, you're mentally disturbed. If you're that, you're going to be depressed and have C PTSD or something like that, which, you know, so that's the equivalent of being in the service and having your, you know, somebody blown up beside you in service, you know, something like that. So, yeah, I, 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 I just don't believe it's the unpardonable sin, but I'm not, I'm not saying that it's what God wants us to do either, you know, so. Exactly. Just, um, yeah. I, I always look at it this way, you know, God knows our heart and, um, yeah, he knows if we have mental illness, he knows the root cause of everything. And, you know, we know God's totally fair. And, you know, sure, there's some people that kill themselves that, you know, may be in sin and may go to hell. And there's others that may have mental, mental illness. You know, but God, you know, he's, I never believe he's going to send somebody to hell. Just, well, he, he wrote in the Bible the, what we need to do to go to heaven, of course. But, um, yeah, he knows the heart and if that person was a Christian and maybe they just lost their mind or whatever, you know, that's between them and God. I always uh, looked at it that way. And on the, uh, the other, other hand, there's people that we may think are the most godly people in the world that are living a secret life that, you know, that we don't even know about that only God knows. So, you know, I always leave, left the judgment to God because we really don't know, you know, who's, you know, the, the, the people's heart when they die or when they're on earth, but, you know, God sees our, our inside, not our words and things like that. Yep. Did you have something, Gene? Um, oh, I was waving at Victor. Victor oh, was. Yeah. He, he said he had to go. Yeah. Because he's in pain. Okay. And I, yeah, that's good. 
We'll be praying for him. Yeah, Mark. May I ask something? Absolutely. Uh, I know uh, Sherry uh, mentioned those people that commit suicide who are not Christian. Well, unfortunately, oh. as you know, they they already condemned. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, we not we not. It's not for us to say where they're going because it's have to. You know, we're not going to judge the person because that's not. We don't have power for that. But we know those who who have not accepted Christ, they're already condemned. Now, going back, as a, going back to a Christian, uh, you know, I, I, I would say accept if the person has some mental issues that is beyond their control. But as a Christian, we have to remember, we have died to ourselves. So there, there's, we always got to think, there's no problem that should come to our life that we cannot handle, like the Bible said. So we always have to go to Christ. You know, like you mentioned, it is sad to say that the, the percentage of, of people committing suicide in church, well, it shouldn't be that way unless, I would say, there's a mental issue. But we as a Christian, we have hope. We have hope in Christ. Amen. Amen. You know I mean? there's, there's no, there's, there shouldn't be no need for someone to get to that uh, uh, despair situation when we have hope in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. When I think about death as being a curse, I mean... When our loved ones die, it's we have our insides get ripped out. Yep. But if you're a Christian, when you die, you go to a better place. Amen. I mean, and, and I think that's the beauty of it. Is and I think something that we as Christians have trouble with today is understanding grace. And I'll tell you, you know, things that in our mind we would say, hey, if you off yourself, you just you just lost. Forget it. Yeah, I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You you just lost. You you shouldn't have killed yourself. You deserve to go to hell. See, God doesn't think that way. We think that way, but God doesn't think that way. You know, we try to say, well, you did something that was just horrid and atrocious. There's no way God would forgive you. Well, if that's the case, we'd all be in deep weeds because, man, we all do atrocious things before God. And so we need to look to him and trust him. And as Martin said, hey, when it comes down to it, it's God that makes the decision. You know, it's his righteousness. It's his grace. It's his mercy that overrules. And it may, it may not even agree with ours, you know, our judgments. But with him, what comes out is right, always. With God, everything is right. So um, it's sad that people would want to take their lives, you know, whether Christian or non-Christian. But the reality is out there. It happens. And the question is, were your, was your heart right with the Lord? That's what it all comes down to. If, you, if not, you're already condemned, as Martin says. That's, that's a done deal. But if your heart's right with the Lord and, you know, it just overtakes for whatever reason, we leave that in God's hands. Yeah. And for his grace and his mercy. The difficult thing is, like, my son is agnostic so i mean how do you deal with that because he asked me one time he's like okay well this he heaven and hell thing if i live a good life where you know i'm giving caring and thoughtful and all this stuff and i do uh good in my life are you telling me i'm gonna go to hell because i didn't proclaim jesus as my savior you know and it's like i really can't answer that i mean you know, I know God sees how you live your life and knows your heart, but if you say that you're not a full believer, you haven't accepted Jesus, um, does that mean you're automatically condemned? You know, um, you know, it's kind of tough because it's not that they believe or they don't believe. Well, no, I mean, being uh, the Bible's clear, it's not about works. Ephesians 2 and 9 makes it clear. Hey, you can be the best person out there. You can do the best for everybody. You can contribute. You can do all these kinds of things for people. Will they get credit for that? Yes, but that will not give them salvation. And I'm, Jesus in the garden, he prayed. He said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Now, if you think that if there was another way to get to heaven by being good, rather than trusting Jesus, that God would have let his only beloved son die on the cross, that horrible death, so that, um, so that other people could get there another way by being good? No. You're, you're saying, um, I, you know, 
Jesus didn't suffer enough for me, so I can do it myself. So you can either pay for your sins or you can let Jesus pay for your sins. But yep. um, I'd rather let Jesus pay for my sins. Well, please pray for my son, Micah, because yeah. it's really scary thinking that he's Absolutely. not going to make it. We'll just have to pray that God lifts the veil off of his eyes because the uh, God of this world has him blinded. So we're just going to have to do some warfare and pray that God will lift that up Amen. of him. Amen. Yep. I agree, yeah, Sherry. Agree. Yeah, Mark. And I will add that people have chosen not to believe and the devil has hardened their heart. Yep. That's the bottom line. They chose not to believe. Remember, God will say, okay, he will pass you over. He'll let you have it, which is hard to say. But as you know, there are plenty of people there that will never come. Well, that would be an atheist, and that's not the same as agnostic. An agnostic um, doesn't believe or disbelieve. They just want more proof that it's real. And that's what oh. this whole lesson is about, right, Sherry? It's, Isn't it about faith? Pray for revelation knowledge that God will show Micah who he is and how much he loves him and, yeah. and that um, he will come to a you know, repentance and salvation and we'll bind that, that evil spirit that's got him blinded and that deaf and dumb spirit that has him blinded will bind it in Jesus name. Right now, okay. according to Matthew eighteen nineteen, we agree right now. We bind that spirit in Jesus name and we loose the spirit of repentance and salvation over Micah. And we trust that, that he will come to salvation in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he has a Bible. He's come to church with us before, you know, um, when he was home from the military, he would, you know, come to the service with us. And he, likes um, Pastor. And he loves Pastor David. But, um, you know, um, he has participated in um, uh, the Lord's Supper at church, but he will not, you know, claim jesus as his savior or get baptized he was baptized as a baby which we know how that goes but um he he doesn't like totally claim it you know what i mean so yeah martin i was just going to say uh, an agnostic is someone who has a, a plate in front of him and say you know what even though i have it it's not there that's basically it's, it's having it and deny it that is not there and, and the thing, too, Sherry, that you have to understand, attending church, um, liking a pastor, being baptized, taking communion. No, it's not good enough. It's not yeah, good enough none of those all. save you. None of those save you. The Bible is clear that there's only one way to salvation, you know, and it's believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and accepting him as the Savior and dedicating, you know, your life to him. Yeah, I mean. It's, it's a commitment to make Jesus Lord of your life. That's the only way to salvation because he's the one that paid the price that the father accepted. So, I mean, none of those other things will save you. I mean, they may be signs after you're saved that you are following him, but they will not save you in and of themselves. So, yes, we, we continue to lift up Micah, Sherry. We and continue. Amber as well because she yeah. hasn't really, oh, yes. you know, uh, you know, confessed her faith uh, oh, she either. Jesus, she but... she claims Jesus as in when I get to heaven kind of thing, but there's no works or our faith there. She hasn't been baptized again or anything. Right. So. Well, Lord, Jesus knows the heart, you know, of the person. And, but yeah, it's, it definitely requires a, a actual mental assertion and a heart change in your part on a part of the person to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not something that just happens. It's not just because you say, I love Jesus, that it happens. It's got to be a turning over of self to him um, and understanding what he's done and understanding that, that, hey, it's not hard. The issue is it's got to be a heart thing. And if it's not, then it's not happened. Because, I mean, I've heard too many people, you know, say, hey, I did the prayer, so I know I'm saved. Uh, yeah, but did you make Jesus Lord of your life? What's that mean? You know, uh, are you, uh, did you commit yourself to follow Jesus all your life? Well, what? What are you talking about? 
you know, and sometimes that happens out there. There are people that think they're saved, but they really haven't given themselves over to him. They haven't surrendered to him. They just did the prayer, you know, the magic prayer, as it were, that makes you a Christian because that's the, when I made the prayer, the pastor said, okay, now you're saved. You're, you're going to heaven. You're one of those that will be there, you know, singing with the Lord forever and ever. Amen. You know, I think sometimes we do a disservice when we try to make it, I read a book called e An Easy Jesus. We, we try to make it an easy Jesus because we don't want to scare people away, but we want them to become members of our church. And we need to be careful with that because, I mean, we're doing a disservice instead of, you know, bringing them truly into the family of God. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I'll also add to that. Remember, it has it's in God's time. Okay, I'm a testimony that I used to say, you know what, when I was young, I'm not going to serve God. I haven't got time for church. I want to have fun. I want to party. I want to do whatever I want. <laughs> when I get old, then I'll get. I'll join the church. You know what? God called me. So, like you mentioned, when the bell is taking off, that's when the person comes. It's not. It's not. It's not by by man's power. You know, it's not. We cannot go out there and pay someone here become a Christian. Amen. It doesn't happen. No. It has to be God's calling, and yet it's going to be on His time. All we could do is pray and 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 talk to them. Well, we can we can save anyone. Amen. And, and, and love on them. I think the biggest one is, man, we need to love on them and let them know that Christ loves them the way we love them and show them that love. I mean, Christ loves them more than we can love them. But if we can show them love, a lot of times, you know, people get alienated because, I mean, they're judged more than they're loved. And we need to show them Christ's love in the process. So. But the Holy Spirit's the one that does the work, not us. Okay. A lot of times we think we're going to force them to be a Christian. You can't force anyone to be a Christian. It's got to be the Holy Spirit doing the work in their heart to draw. And the Father has to draw them, is what the Bible says. So don't ever try to force a person into becoming a Christian. Yeah, you may, you may provide a sense of, of, what's the word I'm looking for? Something like, expediency you may sense a force of expediency want them to get saved but in the end it's still christ that has to do god has to do the work you know i mean and, and we've got to show his love in the process and not be judgmental. yeah you you want it to be expedient because life is so short yes. you know and, and you don't want it to be too late you know amen so like, like Alyssa was saying you know she's sitting next to me and is that, you know, maybe Mike is going to be kind of like Pastor David, where it's going to happen later in his life than now, because I think, you know, Pastor David's stories is, you know, he didn't really get into the church thing, and he had to go all the time because his dad was a pastor, and, you know, it finally hit him when he got to a certain age, and then he turned his life to Christ, but it wasn't from the beginning, you know, and a lot of people are that way as well, you know, it's not from the beginning. Yeah. Um, sometimes it takes a few years for them to get the calling or whatever. Well, it's like Martin said, yeah, it's in God's time, you know, and some people ex are able to accept Jesus early in their lives and live out a strong Christian life for the Lord. Others later in life, you know, I mean, it's different. Every person is different and it's all based on God's time for that person. You know, if, and it's based on whether, you know, they even have a hunger to even want to follow Christ. And you'd be surprised how many just don't even have a hunger. They just see it as a crutch uh, for weaklings, um, you know, in terms of following Christ. And so they just never make the move because they never get, you know, even if God was calling them, they've already hardened their hearts to such an extent they don't want to hear. You know, so, Yeah. I mean, it's sad because, yeah, like you said, Sherry, we, hey, we would want everybody to go to heaven. Who would want, I mean, who in the right mind would want anybody to have to go suffer in hell for eternity? I mean, I, I, I'm not that vindictive to anybody. You know, I, I would want, you know, to be able to have Christ's love for that person and everything. That's, I think, what's important. Any other final comments, additions, subtractions, uh, updates, disagreements? Um, yeah, Mark. 
for just uh, the one they mentioned about the God draws them is John six forty four that says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who Amen. sent me draws him." Amen. The Father has to do the drawing. I'm telling you, and He does it through His Holy Spirit. You know, works through the Holy Spirit. You know, and us, us and the Holy Spirit, because we are His feet and His hands. Yeah. Amen. So, yeah, never lose focus on that. Okay, next week, we'll pick up speaking about Abraham and the faith that Abraham showed. And, I, man, Abraham had an incredible faith. I mean, I look at that, but he was a human man, easily manipulated. <laughs> and so we'll talk about Abraham next week, and uh, we'll, we'll go on from there. So um, I've got, for prayer items... I've got Victor down because, I mean, he's been dealing with pain and that prostate matter of his. I've got Sherry's son, Micah, and Amber, you know, uh, on the prayer list there for, you know, God to at least do good work in their lives and draw them both. You know, if Amber say that, you know, she would, you know, sense God's moving in her life and that she would be able to reflect that totally. Um, anybody else? Pray for my son, Van Julier. Okay. Uh, he just recently went through a bad divorce, and uh, why, the ex-wife, uh, they do a lot of witchcraft, and the baby is in, in that house. So oh, he's just, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's been hard for him because they actually have a lot of envy and evilness in them that they're trying to provoke my son and my son is like no I'm gonna let God in control and they know that the baby cannot be coming every day here because the we had cancer but they don't care about that and they will refuse them to let him see his daughter even that he had the same rights so it's a lot of trouble that he's going through oh, okay yeah we'll definitely be praying for Van Julia amen yes I just want to um you know Pray again for Victor because I'm. I'm guessing you know that he um, was able to get my outside faucet to stop leaking. Yeah, he told us that. Um, Praise the Lord. So I mean, and he also cut my grass, ninety percent of it. Um, and he's seventy-eight years old, you know, and I was just like amazed that Amen. you know he was able to do that. He he paid for all the supplies that he needed to fix that and. Um, he actually gave me an, uh, the lawnmower that he brought over um, because he gets lawn service. So I have two lawnmowers now, which will help me <laughs> will help me finish my whole yard. Amen. Um, however, I don't like the fact that it's a gas lawnmower and it's in my shed, and my shed smells like gasoline now. Yay! <laughs> oh, I hate the smell of gas. That's why I got a battery operated one. Gotcha. So. So um, I did get my root canal, and I'm way better, so much better. Um, oh, praise I don't have God. any pain, pain anymore in my tooth. I did, did Victor um, fix your tooth, too? No, no, no. <laughs> that was an endodontist. <laughs> um, but um, uh, this past week, I, I did have a, um, an, an injury. Um, I had a fire extinguisher fall on the top of my foot. Ow. So... I ended up at the emergency room. Um, praise God, I did not break any bones, but my Amen. foot looks so much worse than what it really feels like. It's black and blue, and oh man, um, it, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't bother me at all. They gave me crutches and a boot, and I haven't needed to wear any of it. Well, so God, God is God has uh, blessed me because even the nurses at the ho the hospital were like, "I can't believe you didn't break your foot." Huh. Um, I Praise said, God. I'm blessed. I have Jesus, you know, so Amen. the only other thing I think I'm going to need um, from what Victor said about my bathroom, that um, the pipe inside the wall is loose and that's why my spout keeps shaking back and forth. Ah. So um, I'm probably going to need a plumber in order to get that all fixed and they're going to have to go into my wall and, you know, secure the pipe and then put everything back on again i'm not sure that he's going to be able to do it so i right. still need a plumber to um fix my bathroom because that's okay. still not fixed we'll so worry about that so yeah but i just i'm i'm so thankful for him he didn't charge me anything and 
Although my faucet does leak when it's on outside, but the whole point was to not leak when it's off because I was wasting water. Amen. So I think he's going to like eventually fix it so it doesn't leak when it's on either. But okay. we got the main thing taken care of. Well, praise praise the Lord. God. Praise yeah. the Lord. Okay, any other prayer requests? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together, to study your word because your word is truth. But I think today's lesson is so important that we accept your word, not by, you know, certain parts, but totally, and that we accept it as your written word, and it's your guidance to us in all situations. Lord, we accept this by faith, and we accept you by faith. And we accept everything you do, knowing that you want the best for us, because that's what you say in your word. But you want us to obey you. And, you know, you tell us to seek first your kingdom, and then all these things will be added. So help us to grow in you, and to walk in your way, and to trust you in and through everything, knowing that you are always there, you are always present and you always want the best for us as your children and that you will develop us in a way that honors and glorifies you. So help us to reflect Jesus in all that we do. Help us to become more like him daily in all that we do so that others may see your wonder through us and may glorify you, dear Heavenly Father. Now, I pray for Victor, Lord, as, as he's dealing with <laughs> this condition as prostate matter. Lord, again, I pray, put your hand on him and fix that problem right away, Lord, so that he's not having to deal with this issue and, uh, you know, and the pain that's been coming with it, especially you've seen that he has been selfless and going and helping Sherry with, you know, the issues that she's had over in her house and with the cutting of the grass Lord, I pray that you would bless him. And I know he's not looking for any praise from us, but Lord, we ask that you would just show him kindness and just put your healing hand on him and also bless him. Give him your peace in terms of what you know about all that's been going on. And, and thank you for our brother, Victor. I pray for Sherry's son, Micah, and for Amber. Lord, I pray that Lord, you know, this world can be a place where, you know, it draws people to it. And this is the domain of Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the one that wants people to follow his way. Lord, I pray that you would open up Micah and Amber's eyes, open up their hearts in a way that they can see that the direction they're going has no hope. Lord, I mean, being good and, and just doing things, you know, being ritualistic doesn't save. Only accepting you, Lord Jesus, and your shed blood, and the fact that you rose from the dead and are seated at the right hand of God, and accepting you, making you Lord of our lives is the only thing, that only action that we can take that brings salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I pray for them both, Lord, that you would open their eyes, provide for them a sense of where they've gone off the track and where they need to come to you, Lord, so that they will realize that this world has nothing to offer and that this world is passing away. But your word will never pass away, Lord. So we look to you to keep your hand on them and draw them to you, Father. I pray for Julie's uh, son, Van Julier, Lord. You know he just went through a divorce, Lord, and the difficulties he's having and being able to have visitation. And the family that, you know, he was with and, and the witchcraft that's going on in that family and the difficulties they're in, Lord, Lord, nothing's impossible with you. So we put this matter in your hands, Lord, because, I mean, there's nothing we in and of ourselves can do, but nothing is impossible for you, Lord. So we look to you to help with this matter, Lord, and that you would show Van Julier the way and also you know, that he might be able to even show your love to these people. And in the process, maybe there can be a change here and these people can realize that, you know, there is no future in witchcraft, not any good future anyway. 
So Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that you would just put your hand in this matter and resolve it, Lord, to your honor and glory. We also pray for Doug and Gail, who obviously weren't able to make it here tonight. I pray that everything's well with them. I pray for their, their uh, daughter and grandchildren, that you would continue to be with them and provide for their need, Lord. I also pray for our sister, uh, Charisma, who isn't here, Lord, and you know what's going on in her life and in her family. We ask that you be there with her and be able to meet her need according to your riches and glory. Lord, I also pray for our president and for our leaders in this country. Lord, we ask that your hand and your wisdom be involved in the decisions being made about all the difficulties that are going on right now, especially this coronavirus and, you know, the, the differences that people have and the prejudices that are so pronounced out there. And I mean, I could go on and on, but obviously there are a lot of situations out there that need your involvement, Lord. And we need to be your hands and feet. Let us reflect you in and through all these situations so that you will get the honor and the glory through it. And that we may reflect you, Lord Jesus, in everything we do to your honor and glory, Lord God. So now as we go, I pray for all of us, Lord, that you would go with us and that you would let us be a light to all those that we come in contact with, first in our families and then those, you know, that we meet in everyday life and that we may show your wonder to them, Lord, in all that we do. Oh, thank you for Angel being here with us, Lord. Glad to see him first time here with us. So just welcoming him here. And, uh, and I pray for all of us that are here today that you would meet all of our needs and let us reflect you and meet all of our family relationship needs too, I pray. We thank you and we love you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Hey, where's your sister? Uh, she went with her son. Came down from North Carolina, and his his uh, I think they call it partner when you're not married. But it, anyway, yeah. And so they went out together. Um, so oh, okay. she's out with them. That's why she's not here tonight. Yeah, I, I don't. I haven't seen her much lately at all. <laughs> That's why I was wondering. She was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she was dealing with some teeth problems, like you, oh, her and too. so she finally <laughs> got that the tooth pulled and the stitches taken out. So she's feeling a lot better now. So she was with okay. us in our last class. Uh, oh, on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm usually not here Wednesday. Yeah, understand. Oh, oh, there is a praise report for Amber. Um, Amen. She she found a um a house to rent in Georgia. Um, oh, praise it's God. Seven bedrooms. Whoa. Oh, a mansion. They have, they have 10 people living in the house, so that's oh, good. Oh, well, yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, so she's moving in on September 1st. Um, wow. So she has a, a house um, to live in now in Georgia. So. Amen. Amen. No hotels. <laughs> yeah. Aaron said good night. Good night, Aaron. God bless your brother. Thank night. you, Ted. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good night, everyone. Hey, good night, Martin. God bless your brother. Tuesday. I mean, yeah, Wednesday. Are we? <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Hey, Elkie, gr great having you here tonight. I hope everything was it was what you needed today and that God was able to speak through what we've been talking about tonight. Good night. Thank night. you. Yeah, you're welcome, Elkie. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good seeing you guys. Good, good seeing you, Ted. Yeah, good Angel. Time. Hey, great having you, brother. Good night, everybody. Everybody. Yeah, God good bless night. you, Angel. Good night, Ted. Good night, Margaret. God bless you, my sister. And see you then, what, Wednesday? Yeah. Hey, Bobby. Uh, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday it is. Hey, Corey, how you? everything going well, brother? Good. Amen. Thank well, you. Praise the Lord. Well, you guys, you guys be good and God bless you and keep you safe. Thanks, you too. Right. The, guy, the guy Patrick that passed that was forty two. Uh huh. Um, they're, ha they're having a Zoom uh, meeting at like seven forty five tonight. They're gonna um, spread his ashes uh, in the ocean. Oh, okay. Gonna, so a memorial uh, service. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, on Zoom. So that should be oh. interesting. I'm yeah, gonna I think it'll be good. Check that out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. 
All right. Well, take well, care. Thank you. Good night. God bless if you. If you find Melissa. a plumber, let me know. <laughs> you got it. God bless. All right. All okay. right. Good night. Yep. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, guys. Yeah. Good night, Julie and Avon. Hey, nice having you here tonight. God bless you both. And take care. Okay. Good night again, Margaret. God bless you. And good night, Ted. You got it. See you Wednesday. And God bye -bye. bless you. Likewise. Likewise. Bye-bye.